All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Adams Brothers Podcast. A good evening, I should say. It's after 6 p.m. Good evening, everyone. Here in South Florida. We are here this evening with our beautiful cousin, Miss Darielle Bond. This is our first time ever meeting our cousin. Uh in person. Well, not in person, but we get a chance to see her beautiful face. Uh, we're going to be talking with our cousin, Darielle Bond, about human trafficking and runaways. So, cousin Darielle, welcome to your cousin's Adams Brothers podcast. Hello, cousin. Hi, family. I'm so excited to be here to be joining you guys. Um, my dad talks so much about you and just to be able to have this conversation, even though you're in Florida, I'm in Texas. It's just, I'm honored. I'm honored. Well, thank you very much. Your dad and your mom, they talk so highly of you. And uh, when they came to Florida, we chopped it up quite a bit. We had a good, good, good time uh, while they were here. And uh, of course, your father's name is Daryl, and my name is Daryl, and we, your name is Daryl, and I have a daughter named Daryl, so uh, yeah. that's kind of unique, you know what I'm saying? Yes. Yes, yes. So so like I said, we're going to be talking about human trafficking and runaways uh, this evening with our cousins. So cousin Daryl, go ahead and um, introduce yourself and tell us a l- little bit about you. Tell our viewers a little bit about you and what you do. Yes. So, you know, my name is Darielle. Um, I've been in this kind of social work community space, I want to say for about three years now. Um, I'm in graduate school studying social work. All right. And I have my bachelor's in psychology. And uh, I stumbled upon human trafficking community work um, through a class. So I took a summer class, actually the summer of 2023. And I learned so much about it. Like usually you hear about these myths of what trafficking is and what trafficking isn't. And I was so intrigued that somehow I just kind of fluttered my way into this organization that I'm working for out here called The Landing. And I've learned so much, met so many great people. And you'd be surprised on the web of people involved in, you know, really stopping and combating this issue. Right. So the landing, tell us a little bit more about the landing for the people here in Florida that, that doesn't know really uh, uh, too much about the landing and what they do. So just give us a little background on the landing. Absolutely. So the landing is an anti-sex trafficking and an anti-commercial sexual exploitation organization. Um, we're based out here in Houston, Texas and off of Bissonette. So for those who aren't Houston natives, and I'm from New York, so I had to learn this as well, but uh, Bissonette is a notorious area for uh, trafficking, um, for the tracks, prostitution, and it was so violent and dangerous that the mayor out here just kind of shut it down. But we're still centralized in that location. It's a drop-in center, so our clients can come in, get a meal, maybe take a nap, Um, watch TV, all for free, get case management. We help them get their IDs, their birth certificates. We help them get their cases dismissed. Like we were such a force in this community just to be a small group of us. Um, And I do outreach. So I work with law enforcement doing stings. Um, We help recover minors or young ladies who may be trafficked or who who may be engaging in survival sex. Um, We meet with women who are in the courts and maybe they get a prostitution ticket. We just want to get them connected to resources. So the overall goal is to not demonize or criminalize people who are engaging in survival sex or engaging in sex work because they have no other options. We just want to be that other option for them. Right. So for the people that don't know what human trafficking is, give us the definition of human trafficking. Yeah, so this this is a good one. So human trafficking, there are 
there are two ways that we can define this. So one is through force, fraud, or coercion, making a person engage in sex or exchange of something of value. So that can be money, drugs, a place to live, um, or just for their safety. But when it comes to someone under 18, it doesn't matter if they were forced. It doesn't matter if they if there's fraud or if there's coercion. Anyone under 18 cannot legally engage in commercial sex. So those are two ways that we can define it. Now, human trafficking can encompass, um, you know, someone working and not being paid sufficiently. So people like to define it as uh, modern day slavery or it could be sex trafficking. And then all the, the smaller ones, which are just as important, organ trafficking, organ harvesting. Um, we hear about a lot of that internationally, but the sex trafficking and human trafficking is happening in our backyards, especially in the border states, uh, Texas, Florida, California, yeah. And, you know, I, I read a little bit about organ, uh, the organ uh, trafficking, for uh, trafficking in for organs, because that's big in other countries, like people that may need a liver or a kidney or or whatever organ that they they need to survive that that's real popular uh, in other countries. Am I correct? That's right. And even here, because the donor list is so long. Um, of people waiting to get life-saving surgeries, life-saving organ transplants that, you know, through, with with no other option, they will go into, I guess, like that underground market and see about getting an organ maybe in another country. And, you know, we never know who is the victim on that other side of that. Right. It's a great book out there, for one, called Medical Apartheid, Ooh, if right. I remember right. The Harriet Washington is the author? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ariel, uh, what groups are the most vulnerable to human trafficking? If, if you could just enlighten us a little bit on what groups are the most vulnerable and uh, share, that, share that with our viewers. For sure. Um, so when it comes to minors, and, and I also want to indicate that too with the landing, we work with minors who may have been trafficked. And what we noticed with um, the vulnerabilities are runaways, are uh, minors who may be in the system, CPS, DFPS, um, minors who are incarcerated, um, we notice even just children online, um, you know, maybe a child to post something online like, oh, I'm really having a hard time at home. A trafficker looks for those little points, those vulnerable spots and seeing if you're having some sort of tension with your family, if you're a loner, um, our LGBTQ youth, youth with disabilities, they pinpoint what they may see as a weak spot or a vulnerable point and they go straight in and the, the point of all of this in a big word that I wanted to point out is grooming, building a relationship, building trust. And it's not always a stranger. A lot of times, and, and this is going to be heartbreaking to hear. And even for me to say, we've seen family members traffic their children. Um, we've had a, a client as young as nine years old who was trafficked. Um, it, and actually, the, the average age when these sorts of things start and when children are vulnerable to this is between 12 and 14 years old. So around that space where kids are a little bit more independent, a little bit more reliant upon their friends, that's that space. That's that spot where we want to definitely get in there and fill those gaps. I was going to ask you, did you... Did you know anyone personally that you you know have been uh, used as a um, uh, human tra trafficking that's been involved in human trafficking? I would say doing this work is the first time where I've met that these very strong young ladies. They are strong. Um, we like to call them survivors, overcomers. But growing up, I I don't 
think I have, but I might have, but and just didn't know. And a lot of people, that's a big part too, is the self identification. A lot of people don't self identify because they don't know trafficking is a is a huge word. When we think of trafficking, we think of the movie Taken. We think of the movie Sound of Freedom. We think of what the media pumps to us. But a person can be trafficked and still go to school every day, or maybe they're missing days. That's that's another big spot of like seeing the um, the signs of it. So it, it's really spreading the awareness, like what we're doing right now, talking to families, talking to parents, and letting them know that it's it's not always that stranger danger. It's not structured in this linear in this linear way. It can come from someone who you would never even expect. We we've heard cases out here in Houston, pastors that were traffickers, men in the military that were traffickers, even peers, young teenage girls were trafficking other girls. And of course we consider them to be victims, but we still want to look at those spaces where there's peer on peer violence. So it's it's a complicated situation, but it's really good to just be able to talk candidly about it. Yeah. And Daria, who are the traffickers? Are they mostly uh, from here in the States or are they foreign? That's a great question. It's a loaded question. I'm gonna be real and say, it's anyone. It could be anyone. Um, I wouldn't turn a blind eye to anything that you see as odd or weird. Um, I would, if we're talking about domestic trafficking, it's more than likely someone that the, the child, if we're talking about children who are mostly at risk, but anyone can be at risk. Cause we see that just to kind of go off on a tangent out here in Houston, we've seen trafficking happen in cantinas. We've seen trafficking happening in, in massage parlors. And these are women who are, well in their 50s and 60s, but those vulnerabilities that we talk about of maybe being undocumented, maybe not speaking English and not sure, not sure who to talk to because we don't speak the same language. Um, maybe they're taking their documents from them and they can't flee. Um, so when we talk about the traffickers, it could literally be any, um, and domestically, it's more than likely someone that the victim knows. Yeah, and I wanted to ask, since you went into that, how is migrant, how, how is human trafficking different from migrant smuggling? Ooh, yes. So trafficking or sex trafficking doesn't have to encompass moving one person from one place to another. It it can, but that that's not a requirement for it to be trafficking. Now, for someone to be smuggled, um, that's a, a different... That's a different situation in a sense where a person can be smuggled in, maybe pay a coyote or whatever, or maybe have something what we call debt bondage, where now the coyote feels like, okay, now I have, and a coyote, if to, to kind of define that, is a person who is supposedly helping the person come from one country to another and may charge a fee, may charge the family a fee, may put a lien on the family's home as some sort of collateral. Um, so when the person comes in and they're smuggled, they may not be trafficked. They Their labor may not be exploited. They may not be sexually exploited. They just were smuggled into the country. But we see that those things, they encompass each other. So if a person is smuggled, more than likely they're being trafficked for their labor. Um, and we've seen some cases of that. The landing doesn't necessarily deal too much with labor trafficking, but we know for sure in Florida, in Texas, in California, it's happening. And I keep mentioning those three states because those are the top three states where trafficking is happening at rampant numbers or, or um, it's being reported, rather, I'll say, and, and rampant numbers. Those are the top three. California is number one, Texas is number two, and Florida is number three. Florida is always in the mix of all the illegal activity that goes on around here in this country, man. Yeah. Florida, <laughs> Florida is just a mess, you know. Yeah, <laughs> has a lot to do with uh, you know, just just politics. You know, it all some of it boils down to politics, but uh, 
uh, I mean, what some of the uh, what are like, let's say if, if, if these traffickers are caught, how mm-hmm. severe is the punishment? for these traffickers uh, are they getting a lot of time in prison or did they just getting a slap on the wrist and ju- they just letting them out of prison uh, uh how severe is the punishment if you know uh it, could you share that with us well i i don't really know too much about what happens after the process because we're we're more focused on um, victim advocacy but oh. Um, it depends on from the relationships that we do have with law enforcement out here it depends on how I guess organized the the trafficking was. So there's there's a term called a stable, and a stable is if a pimp or a trafficker has multiple girls, they call that a stable. And if the girls are underage, it's a bunch of them. Maybe it's guerrilla pimping. Guerrilla pimping is through violent acts. The Romeo pimping is if it's a boyfriend. I I believe that the charges may be different depending on the tactics. Um, but I'm I'm honestly not too sure. I just know that if it's more of an organized situation, that they may see harsher penalties. Um, if they've been um, transporting the girls between states, um, you know, you're committing crimes in in different states. That that may add on to to the convictions or the the charges rather. Right. So, you know, I don't know. A lot of times, law enforcement to come out with the newer numbers and the newer figures on these uh, charges and convictions, we're going to have to wait for that report, but I'm interested in seeing that myself. I am. Right. Right. One one of our viewers, Erica Yorker said, is there any age exempt from uh, trafficking? I think you may have answered that, but is there any age exempt from trafficking? Unfortunately, no, I, I really wish I could say yes, but unfortunately, no. Um, we heard of a crime. Well, we didn't actually see it. It didn't come across the landings desk, but it was a really heartbreaking and just disgusting story of a mom trafficking her two-year-old. Um, and the two-year-old died as a result. So I, I would just say, and, and I'm not saying these things to scare people. I'm saying these things so that you can feel empowered and you know what's going on. And as I, I think the biggest thing is that grooming process, building the trust with the child. If it's a coach, if it's a, a teacher, if it's, you know, someone at camp, a mentor, just really watching those relationships really closely. If a child is coming home and like, where did you get all of this money from? If they're missing days from school, if they're having a lot of medical issues, um, STIs are a big one um pregnancies things like that and and you're a teenager that's where it's like okay well before any of that is going down just keep a close eye and have like candid real conversations with kids especially with what's going on online because we've even found there's a calendar app I'm sorry a calculator app and it's actually like a dating conversation chatting app, but it it hides itself as a calculator so that traffickers or older people can lure kids in and just have conversations with them and meet up with them. And then before you know it, things are happening. So I, I would just say to kind of wrap all of that up is looking at the relationships that our children are having. Who are these people? And, you know, those smiling faces, those smiling coaches, those smiling whoever's watching that really closely. And to go off of that just now, Daria, you said coaches. Mm -hmm. Do you see that a lot in sports as human trafficking in sports? Because I know I was watching TV earlier and we've been hearing a lot lately about the WWE, the wrestling where they were involved in sex trafficking, uh, with Vince McMahon and he was, he has taken himself out of the uh, company now. Uh, do you hear, do you hear a lot about it in sports is the question in general? Ooh, um, I wouldn't say in particular, but I, 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 I guess I kept honing on coaches because I was, I was also hearing things like that, but within baseball, I didn't hear that with the wrestling. I'm going to have to really look that up, but I've even seen it with um, the the Boy Scouts. There's a great documentary 
on Netflix just talking about the whole organized system of Boy Scouts. Yes. Um, I, I would say if there's any organization or anything dealing with the youth, the risk is there, unfortunately. And not everyone is, is nice and great people like us. There are people who get into these sorts of spaces and they're either, um, that was their intention or it happens spontaneously. You know, we don't know. But if there's ever an organization and you're working with the youth, the risk is there. Yeah, definitely. When you get an opportunity, check the, uh, read about the WWE, the wrestling part where, like I say, the owner Vince McMahon and one of his assistants were allegedly accused. Federal, they're under a federal investigation right now for sex trafficking. Uh, but I could see that happening in wrestling because I've seen so many other stories over the days of uh, uh, sexual assault and uh uh, just advances being made at some of the wrestlers back in the day. So yeah, when you get an opportunity, definitely check that out about the WWE. Absolutely. Uh, Will do. And 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 Dario, do you see more male victims of sex trafficking or female? What is the percentage that you see? We see a lot more uh, female um, victims, and I. Now, here's the thing, which is a, a thing that I think about often. Is it happening at the same rate? Are girls more susceptible to be victimized? Or is it because girls are more likely to outcry? Are boys less likely to outcry because of it's not supposed to happen to me? I'm a boy. What does that mean about me? What does that mean about my sexuality? I should have done this. I should have done that maybe the shame that's built around it. Cause even just as you were talking about with, um, you know, these documentaries that are coming out now, we're seeing about with the boy scouts, we're seeing it with the Catholic church and boys coming out and saying things, they wait decades to actually come forth and say something, something happened to me. And you know, I, I often wonder, what is it? Why are we seeing more of the outcry of girls? Are girls just more susceptible? Or is it because girls are more likely to say something? Um, and we also want to kind of cut into that culture of boys walking around their entire lives, holding on to that. Um, and, and maybe if we can get more boys to speak out, maybe the numbers will start balancing out where we're seeing it's happening at the same rate. And we also see uh, or heard of forms, I don't know whether it's true or not, also allegedly in the music industry. And we just recently saw that with the past case of uh, R. Kelly. It was alleged that he was uh, trafficking women uh, over the years. And, and, and I know we, like you say, we, it's a lot of documentaries out there. We saw some of them on a and &E, I believe it was called surviving R. R. Kelly or something of that nature. Uh, but yeah, how, how prevalent do you hear about it in the music industry? Oh, I'm seeing it just along with y'all. Same thing with this Diddy, these Diddy allegations that are coming out, P Diddy allegations and what, Cassie alleges in her uh, lawsuit, that's trafficking. That's trafficking 101, that's straight up, especially being moved around, um, being forced. If we talk about that force, fraud, or coercion, those are the top three to remember when they're adults. Um, absolutely, that was trafficking. It was disgusting to read that you start thinking about people who you've grown up listening to you've grown up consuming their work and I would just say from based off of this work whenever it's like some sort of secret society secret organization it's things happening behind closed doors because it just has to be so exclusive there's probably some type of abuse going on behind there yeah Let's talk a little bit about runaways. Now, we know why people run away from home, because obviously there's something going on at home that they don't like. Or there are some rules and regulations that 
the parents or the grandparents or whoever they're staying with that they don't want to follow or they're just being hard headed and defiant, you know, and, 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 and they run away from home and they end up uh, out in the streets. And to me, that makes them more vulnerable to sex trafficking. Uh, uh, do, do you see more runaways uh, that that's that's been caught up in sex trafficking uh, that 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 has run away from home? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's one of, you know, one of the biggest indicators um, is a child running away from home. There's probably some sort of abuse happening at home. And we've seen that also as a vulnerability. If a child was abused in the past, uh, the susceptibility of them being trafficked increases. That doesn't mean it's going to happen. It's just the risks we want to talk about and protecting them from those risks. So there was a young lady, and of course, I'm not going to give too many identifiers, but right. mm -hmm. she was running away from a really bad situation. Both of her, one of her parents was incarcerated. Another parent passed away and she was living with the grandmother and um, the grandmother could do but so much because she was disabled. Once the grandmother passed away, she was living with the foster family. The foster family was abusive. She ran away and got caught up with someone who, oh, I see you out here. You're so beautiful. Let me help you. And, th and that help will go on for however amount of time. Like traffickers are patient. They'll pay, they're, they are patient. They will build that trust. They will take a lot of time building the relationship. And then before you know it, you got to pay it back somehow. And, oh, I'm just going to put some pictures of you online. Look, you're so beautiful. People should want to see that. You should want to feel good about your body and, and share that with other people. So these are these things that these girls, she's probably never heard in her life that she was beautiful. So having this person who is like, oh, he took me in. He took me in when I ran away, when there was no other family member looking for me. Yeah, I can trust him. I don't think he would hurt me this way. He's saying this is not a bad thing. Let me continue going with that. Before you know it, now they're turning tricks. Now they're being trafficked. And um, we had the opportunity to meet her through one of these recoveries with, you know, cops, they they pose as being undercover. And instead of arresting them, they connect them with advocates. And she was just telling me so much about her story. We talked for hours. And it the hurt doesn't begin at the trafficking. That began a long time ago when she was a little girl. And those are the, the, the pinpoints and those points that we want to talk about because people look at, oh, someone was out here doing this. Well, that started a while ago. The abuse started a while ago. The pain started a while ago. So we're noticing that with runaways, that they are extremely vulnerable. And there are a lot of people out here who are preying upon them. But, and, and the force is growing, there are a lot of us who just want to help, who just want to fill in that gap, who just want to talk to them and tell them being a teenager is hard. I can't even imagine being a teenager right now with all the pressure, all that's going on, being online, your whole life is online. I got a chance to experience, I'm only 30, but I got a chance to experience life without being glued to my phone. So I can't imagine being a teenager right now in the type of pressures that they're under. Do you see a high percentage of young black uh, females or and males uh, that, that run away from home? I'm not sure of that statistic of, of them running away. But uh -huh. I know that we see a lot of young black girls who are our clients at the landing. There are a lot of young black girls. There are a lot of black women. There are a lot of older black women too, who are clients of ours and who throughout most of their life just experienced so much pain and, you know, we're in a different time where, although it's a lot of pressures, there's a lot of great things when we're talking about mental health, community building, that wasn't always like that, especially for our older clients. They couldn't um, disclose if they were dealing with anxiety. They probably didn't even know what they were feeling was anxiety. 
And now we're in spaces where we're talking about it more openly. And I'm studying social work. So, you know, we are studying the DSM-5 TR. We're studying these things. I'm able to go into the room and identify like all of that anger. That's probably because you're depressed. A lot of people don't equate anger with depression. A lot of people don't equate anger with anxiety. It's just, oh, look at her. She She's an angry Black woman. We hear that a lot. Right. But it's, it's so much going on under those waters. And I just, for me, the reason why I do this work is because I want fellow Black women to know that you have a safe space to talk with me, to talk with other Black women who are, who are doing our thing in social work and understanding what this looks like and not just throwing a label on you and telling you to just go on about your way. Yeah. And Daria, when survivors seek help, are they given access to cell phones and housing? Ooh, so um, I would love to talk about that. So let's just say, and I'll talk about the journey. So they'll meet with us with an outreach team. We'll do an intake and then we'll connect them with our drop-in center. So during the intake, we assess those needs. So we ask them a bunch of personal questions, their criminal record, medical record, um, that's also included in mental health. And we assess those needs. Are you homeless? That's a big one. We see a lot of homeless women, a lot of people without homes um, partaking in survival sex. Um, do you need a, a job or do you want to go straight? That's a term that we hear a lot too. We are just getting out of the life. Um, Cause not only do we work with people who are trafficked, we work with people who are renegades and a renegade is, is a woman who doesn't have a pimp, but she is in the commercial sex industry. And a lot of them want to get out of it. So we assess that if you want a straight job, um, child care, what's going on with that? We help with transportation. So the first time they come to the drop-in center, we send them a, a Lyft or Uber. We may give them a bus pass. And it's not like the bus pass is in New York, but Houston, they trying a little bit. They doing a little something. It's, it's not the best in my opinion, but I, I'll work with it. Um, we'll assess like, were you stamped? with a, your trafficker's symbol. Cause a lot of times the trafficker, remember we talked about that stable, they'll give all of the girls the same tattoo, such and such as property, daddy's property. You want that covered? You want that removed? We'll help you get that tattoo covered and removed. Um, so once we assess those needs, they come into the drop-in center, they get their case management, we get right to it. And that same young lady that I talked about, who I was able to meet through a sting, she got her first apartment. So we absolutely help with housing. Um, there's a great organization out here called Ambassadors for Christ, and they move fast. They get these girls' apartments, and there's no strings attached. For the first time, maybe in their lives, there's you don't have to exchange anything for anything. We don't want anything from you. Just show up. Do some of these uh, 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 former victims of human trafficking and runaways do they do they come back to the landing and 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 help mentor uh, these younger uh, women and men that's probably uh, that's coming into the landing that that needs to help? Do they do you have them come back and help mentor uh, these uh, ones that are going through the human trafficking and runaways? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes during their first intake date, they're like, I'm ready to help other girls. I'm like, hold on, let's get you situated first. You got to put on your own life jacket first right. and then you can assist others. They are so ready. They want to be a part of that ripple effect to help other girls talk about their experiences with other girls. Um, there's a curriculum that we run called My Life, My Choice, and it's targeted towards uh, teenage girls. And we're about to start our first cohort March 8th at um, this juvenile justice facility out here in Houston. And it it asks for us to bring in, in a survivor and a person who's openly ready and further along in their journey to talk about it because it can be re-traumatizing, right? Talking about these really hard experiences that you've had. So we want to make sure that a person is ready to share, ready to, you know, spread that knowledge and awareness. Um, 
So I, I was, I see a lot of women who are just ready to help and ready to jump in, especially for, for young girls. They're ready. What, what advice do you have to offer uh, someone that, that has run away from home or they are currently uh, being used as a human, hu human trafficker, uh, used in human trafficking, I should say, what advice do you have for them? Man, cause I, I have my, um, the national trafficking hotline. So I would say to go talk to a trusted adult, get some help. Um, I'll get you guys the human trafficking hotline number. And this is national. So wherever you are in the country, um, you can use this hotline. It's 888-373-7888. Again, that's 888-373-7888. It's open 24 hours, seven days a week. Um, English and Spanish. I and that's the National Trafficking Hotline? The National Trafficking Hotline. Um, get to a trusted adult. If you're in Houston and you hear my voice and you need help or support, I got a number for you. Because what we do is we give out these great bracelets. They're so cute. It's different colors, right? But we have our numbers inside just in case you need to be discreet. Um, so that's 281-645-0150. Um, connect with a trusted adult, get someone, someone at a store, flag someone down to get out of that. I want to let them know that that trafficker or that pimp doesn't love you and doesn't care about you. If they did, they would never put you in that situation. I would also tell them that it's not their fault because what can come out of that is a lot of shame and guilt. Um, you were manipulated and taken advantage of. And for a lot of people, let's just say maybe not in a situation as severe as women, as young people, we get into spaces where we can be manipulated and taken advantage of. I've had my experience of someone manipulating me and, you know, making me feel uncomfortable. And then when I get out of it, I'm like, oh, that's what that was. Because when you're in it, you're not sure how to self-identify what is this thing is these new terms that we're learning about but they've always been around we just weren't sure that it applied to us so I would say to them you know connect with someone that they can trust just outcry talk to someone you you are considered a victim you will not go to jail or you at least you shouldn't um, there's a federal law the TVPA the Trafficking Victims uh, Protection Act that was put in place in the year 2000. And that's to make sure the situation is just as this, that they're looked at as victims. Because before people in this situation were arrested, they were criminalized, they um, collected felonies. So now because of things like this, the TVPA, they're looked at as victims and advocacy organizations are able to get connected with them and get them resources. Is there a, um, is there a number that they could call uh, the landing and are you on social media, any social media platforms? Yes. Yeah, so the landings number, hold on, let me shout my people out. Um, shout them out. So the landing has a website. We are the landing.org. We are a nonprofit. So we, fully funded by grants. Um, if, if you want to support in any way, please call us. Um, we're right off of Bissonette. We're, we're located in Houston, Texas. Um, and what was the second question? I'm sorry. Oh, uh, are you on social media? Yeah. Yes. So I am on Instagram. My Instagram is black photos. That's B as in boy, L A Q U E underscore P H O T O S. That's just my personal um, Instagram, but I do post things on like human human trafficking awareness month, which was in January. Um, other, I think February was teen violence, teen dating violence awareness month. So I will be posting things on, you know, what's going on through the different months, um, any sort of activism, advocacy situations, you know, follow me. Thank you. All right. Is there anything you have any more questions, Wayne? Yes, uh, Dariel. Foster kids are at an increased risk 
Mm -hmm. uh, for being trafficked. What percentage of survivors do you work with that have been in the foster care system? Oh, um, I don't have an actual number, but mm -hmm. I would say we we probably see a good portion of clients and young ladies that come in who were in the foster care system, especially if we meet them or if we have some sort of outreach initiative at the juvenile justice facility. So it, it unfortunately, it feels like a pipeline, like, you know, a child being caught up in the system and then somehow they end up in these juvenile justice facilities. That's why we want to go out there and talk to them to really kind of gauge, you know, where they are, what they know. And at the landing, we have youth advocates who travel around the whole city of Houston and they have a caseload of kids. They meet with them. They take them out to maybe skating or to go into the movies, but just a lot of case management too. They'll show up at the hospital. It could be you know, a, a child possibly made a suicide attempt and our advocates, they show up. If one of our children got caught up in a sting or a law enforcement situation, one of our advocates will show up. So um, I, I would say that's a big vulnerability is, is a, a child feeling like they have no community or support. It doesn't necessarily have to be their mom and dad. You know, situations happen, maybe your mom and dad passed away but at least some sort of community. Where's the extended family? Um, where is just somebody who loves them? And I think that is what protects them more than anything. And you mentioned the hospital. Do ERs have a resource list so they can refer people for help? Sure. If, if a person comes in particularly a child and there's evidence of trafficking or maybe there's just some person standing by answering questions on the behalf of of the child hospital staff are trained to call an advocate so that could be us at the landing the y also has um resources for trafficking victims we work closely with the y um bcfs unbound um it, it, it's so many organizations out here in Houston, we work together. It's, it's a well-oiled machine of all advocates getting together and being on those lists, those resource lists at hospitals, uh, law enforcement, we get emails from often. This this person here, can y'all connect with them and get them resources? So it really works to know the hospital staff, to know the police, to know lawyers, people in, in the government, we have contacts all over because it affects everyone. It affects the entire community. I wanted to just say real quick that trafficking is like over a billion dollar industry. Um, and it's about to surpass, you know, the, the drug organizations. Do y'all know why? Do y'all know why it, it may surpass that? Why? Because you can sell a person over and over again. Oh, wow. Once you do, you do a drug deal, that's it. But a, a person, many times, an infinite amount of times. So that's just another thing to keep in mind. It's it's jarring to hear that, but it's good to know it so that we can all kind of get together and stop this from happening if we can. Right. And, and, and me just looking, if, if, if I'm out in public and I'm just walking out down the street or whatever, it will for me. I, I don't have an eye to recognize or or see uh, human trafficking. Um, I don't know uh, uh, what advice can you offer somebody like me that like if I just happen to stumble upon some human trafficking, how would I notice some signs that you know that wait wait a minute something is not right here. I need to call law enforcement. To be honest, that's kind of hard because. You know, we talked about that relationship building. So yeah. a person can be can be in love or what they perceive to be love with their traffickers. So they it may not even look peculiar to you. It may not even look like there's an issue. But if you're seeing something that's like something in my gut is not right, maybe this child is staring at me or signaling to me. And we all want to feel like that. Like you walk into a all store. Right. And you're like, oh, I was the person who noticed it. You may not, you may not notice it. It, it, it may come in a way where it could be a child's friend. 
and you notice it that way, um, like your your child's friend, and you notice it that way, like they have a, a lot of money or they have a lot of expensive clothes, but we know that their family doesn't have a lot of money. It could be things like that. It It's not something based in the movies where a child is being yanked around and they're screaming for help and then they pull them in a white van. That right. you may not see that. Um, more than likely you won't see that because trafficking and those those sorts of crimes of abuse, a savvy pimp or trafficker is not going to do that in in the public eye. They're not. Um, so it's it's best to a person who wants to get involved, um, partner up with partner up with the organization, um, get some training going donate and donate anything not just money clothes they need clothes baby clothes hygiene products brushes toothbrushes toothpaste they need all sorts of stuff so I, I would just say that's a, a better way to do it than to also even put yourself in danger and try to stop something because even the the victim can be mad at you too so we, we just got to take our time with these sorts of things and everybody you know to just be safe and, you know, if your gut is saying something, I would say, call the police. Yeah. And, 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 and Daria, how would you, what advice would you have uh, to a person that is just started dating or is in a relationship with someone that has been trafficked before? Uh, how would you advise them, your expertise to have that conversation with them about when that conversation comes up. So how would, what would I say to a person who is in a relationship with a person who's been trafficked? Yes. What kind of advice would you give them in dealing with that? When that person talk, when the conversation come up and uh conversation come up to talk about it. Yeah. So th that in particular, if you're dealing with, and I don't even want to say the word dealing with, if you are in community or in relationship or um, it, it's a reciprocal love with a person who's been abused, take your time with them. Do not force them to do anything, even if it's something, well, I just asked them to do this. That can be a lot by just that little small thing that you ask them to do. Get professional help. Um, and be patient and to also know that it's not an easy thing to work through and get to like a normal or a healthy sense of intimacy after something like that. I can't imagine being in a space and being intimate with unknown people so many times in my formative years, what that can do to a grown person, what that can do to a person who's trying to live their, their lives in a different way now, we don't know how that can affect them. So be patient with them, be loving with them. And if it becomes to be too much, you know, don't lie to yourself and stick around and then you do more harm than good. If you can't handle something like that, get someone professional help, still probably be in community with them, still be their friend. But if it's not going to work in terms of a relationship, don't string them along. And I know you have some success stories of people who came out of uh, human trafficking through your organization. Can you kind of, you know, without going into too many details, can you kind of share some of the success stories that... Uh, came out of that um so I, I wish I had more because I actually just I, I haven't been with this organization for too long but from what I'm seeing is just a young lady who was able to get her apartment and we um we do work with this consulting firm called that girl Tracy Tracy Dudley is a survivor out here in Houston she's amazing she's street smart she's street savvy and I would say she's an amazing survival story because she was in the life many years ago and now she's doing so much work she's dedicating so much of her life her name is Tracy Dudley again mm -hmm. um, she is dedicating so much of her life to helping train people like me tra training people who 
feel like, man, I'm just, I feel so small in this really big issue, training them on how to approach the situation, the awareness, what's the difference between renegade and trafficking? What, what are the different motivations, survival sex, sex for drugs, because someone may have a, um, a really bad substance abuse issue. So, you know, Tracy is probably one of the biggest survival stories I've seen thus far. And I'm hoping that, if, you know, we'll be able to come together and have more of these sorts of conversations because I want to have more stories for y'all. Um, so far, I was just really excited. Just even just that one, that one girl who was able to get her apartment was more than enough for me. Yes, that's that's all I have for you. I yeah, well, we thank you. We've been we've been you very you enlighten us very yeah, much you, today. You because uh, really I didn't know much about human trafficking. We did have a, another guest on uh, about a year or so ago, and she uh, she lives here in our, our home town here and she was on talking about human trafficking but still there's so much more to be learned about human trafficking uh, yes. again that I don't know and things that I can recognize because I'm usually nosy about everything I can point out I, I, I just watch everything so uh, I'm going to have to uh, myself keep a better eye out for um, suspicious things like human trafficking and you know uh, maybe report it uh not maybe i will be reporting it to uh law enforcement so uh, we've been talking to our beautiful cousin uh darielle bond we've this is our first time seeing her yeah. face right here on our on our interview and on our podcast yeah. here and uh darielle uh is uh out there in houston texas and she is uh the with the landing.org and she gave us some really really good uh uh uh, nuggets to go back and 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 just apply it to our lives and what to look out for. There's a national uh, human uh, trafficking hotline. It's 24 hours a day. Uh, the number to that line is 888-373-7888. So if you are out there watching right now, and if you are a are currently in uh, involved in human trafficking. Uh, Tell someone, you know, try your best to get away and let someone yes. know, uh, run off, you know, just run, scream, blow the horn, whatever you can do, run to the nearest law enforcement officer and, and get out. And if you need some help after you've got out of uh, uh, that human trafficking or if you've run away, uh, get in contact with the landing, the landing ORG on the on the on the Internet. And um, for the people that's watching right now, if you want to donate, you can donate. Give them that, that them address that again, that information yes. again, Daria. You want to donate to the landing? If you want to donate? Yes. So, again, that website, just as Cuzzo stated, thelanding.org. Our phone number is 713-766-1111. Um, we have an amazing mobility manager named Leah who connects with our donors and grantors. Um, we're located off of Bissonette. If you're a Houston native, you know about Bissonette. Um, and we're just a small little space, a community of amazing, powerful women. And, um, you know, whatever it is that you want to do, if you just want to call and pray with us, if you want to donate a meal, if you want to donate some clothes, some baby clothes, um, if you have a, a pickup truck and you want to just use the truck so we can move stuff around, any little bit helps this is community work and there's no small role wow yeah. well thank, thank you very you. much we've been talking to our beautiful cousin Darielle bond uh she uh, again is involved with the landing.org out there in houston texas we want to thank you so much for uh stopping by your cousin's podcast the adams brothers podcast and come back please come back, come back again anytime you want to share some information with us about human trafficking and runaways please come back come back come back and talk to us uh so happy to see you here on the podcast i have your number and uh, you know I'm, i got your number now i'm gonna be texting you so hey that's your yes. cousin down here in florida so, so thank you all so much it was a pleasure Thank you. Absolutely, thank you, absolutely. Dario. I see your dad is watching. He said, "Thank you, cousin." So, <laughs> thank you, cousin John Bond, brother. We love you, cousin, up there in New York. Yeah. 
You have a beautiful daughter. Thank you so very much. Yes. You're uh, beautiful and, and intelligent and educated. Thank you for coming. And hello, on. Brenda, too. And hello to your shout mom, out, Brenda. Mommy. Got a yeah. shout out, Mommy. Hey, got a shout yes, out, your got mom. Got a shout out, Brenda. We met them here. Yeah. They were here in Deerfield Beach at my house and at my hey. mom's house, and we enjoyed them when they were here. Yes, yes. And we will look forward to my parents. Thank you. Many more times together. So, Dario Bond, thank you for uh, stopping by and educating us on human trafficking and uh, runaways. Thank you so very much, cousin. And we love you and we'll be in contact. Thank you very okay. much for stopping by. It was a pleasure. Thank you, guys. Absolutely. Have a good evening.